Welcome to the next episode in the series I've started on the Commodore Plus 4. Again, the Commodore Plus 4 is a computer that eluded me through my Commodore days. If you're interested in catching up with us, go back and look at the first two episodes. The first episode was kind of my Commodore story. What was my very first Commodore computer? And then we opened the box on a Commodore Plus 4 that I received from eBay. In episode two, we take a look at the first chapter, kind of the front matter and the first chapter of the user's manual. And in this episode, we're gonna cover chapter two. Before we start this episode though, I wanna catch you up on a few things. I'm showing you the screen below because I wanna share a couple of things with you. First of all, I do have a comprehensive set of episode notes. Every episode that I have in the series, if you look down below in the episode description, there will be a link to a companion blog post. You're definitely gonna to wanna to check out the companion blog post. It'll have my notes, it'll have additional tips, it'll have additional thoughts. It'll also have all the links you need. And then I'll also put some links in the description below. But if you really want the full feature, the full meal deal, so to speak, as a good retro kind of theme, uh, make sure you check out the companion blog post for all of that information. Last episode, I also talked about the user's manual, which we see here. And the Commodore Plus 4 user's manual has gotten some bad press, so to speak, on the uh, forums and the uh, blog posts as not being one of the best user manuals. And I really wanted to kind of uh, compare it to a Commodore 64, which seems to be like the creme de la creme of the Commodore user's manuals. Unfortunately, all I have is the Commodore VIC-20, which, uh, spoiler, if you haven't watched my first episode, this was my very first computer. My very first uh, Commodore was my very first computer. It was a VIC-20. So I thought maybe just a quick comparison of these two. And so as I look at the Plus 4 manual, it it's okay. It's obviously on a lower stock quality paper than what we're going to find on the VIC-20. It is in a single black and white with one additional color print across the top and in some of the titles. So it's, it's basically a two color print. And so that's the Commodore Plus 4 manual. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, there's nothing more than what you need in the manual, right? So that's right there. On the other hand, if we come in and we take a look at the VIC-20, personal computing on the, a friendly computer guide. Nowhere on here does this say friendly. If I remember, the Commodore 64 was also a friendly guide, I believe. Um, again, if, if, if I'm mistaken, please let me know down in the comments. But if we open it up, the first thing we're gonna notice is it is two color, but it's on the shinier stock. It is definitely a better stock of paper. Uh, but then the also, the other thing I really like is we have our little Commodore uh, plus uh, our Commodore VIC-20 guy down here who's kind of guiding us through. So we have these really fun images. This really seems to be, these images are more fun. They look like they were kind of created, uh, hand-drawn some of them and then put on there. But I mean, you look at these, it, it, again, it's a retro look, but it's really got a more fun look. It's got these thought balloons out here. Don't forget, from now on, use. Uh, just some really fun things. It is not a full color manual. Again, it is only a two color manual. It's black, white, and blue, obviously. But you do have just, I mean, look at this. I mean, a little French uh, beret on our Commodore VIC-20. How fun is that? Uh, but you're going to find these the smattering of fun all throughout this manual. You are going to find absolutely no smattering of fun in here so far. I've read this and I don't see anything uh, that is fun. It's really more geared at the business user, which it should be because as we talked about the last episode, this computer, the Commodore Plus 4, is really geared towards the business user. That's where it was designed. It was going to be a business machine uh, and maybe a home business to small business. We're never going to see these in corporate industry, but that's what it was designed. But it was part of another series that included the C116 and it also included the C16. Now, these are pretty easy to come by on eBay. I shouldn't say easy to come by. You can find them on eBay. Uh, basically, the C16 is the same computer as the Plus 4, less memory. You see the memory is only 16 kilobytes, where this one is 64 kilobytes, and this doesn't include the integrated software. This was designed kind of to be just a lower-end version of this, but then they were trying to come out with this other version, 
the C-16, which was supposed to compete with the Timex Sinclair and be a $99 computer. It was 16 kilobytes as well, but it had this chiclet style keyboard. So this was going to be more of the home version of this series where I'm not sure what this was supposed to be other than this with a real keyboard. Who's going to buy that? I'm not sure. And then this would be for people who are trying to run a small business. So I thought I would share those with you. We've not really talked about the series. I don't own these two. I would love to get a hold of these. I do have a good friend, Jamie, who has a C16, uh, who has offered to let me take a look at that. We may look at that a little bit later on. That's way down the road. So Jamie, you can hang on to that for a while. I also know that uh, there's several of us trying to get hold of one of these. If uh, somebody knows where we can get that uh, little device and bring that in here for an episode, I would love to do, to do that and do a comparison. Eventually, I'd love to compare all three and just kind of run through them. But for now, We've got a lot of work ahead with the Plus 4. A lot of chapters to get through, a lot of great information. Uh, also, just to let you know, pieces are starting to come in for some of the parts that I'm going to use to modernize the device. This will eventually get a Raspberry Pi 1541 connected. I'm going to need these to create a cable. So parts are starting to come in. I'm really excited about where the series is headed, and I think I've got some really great things for you. So this episode is chapter two using the keyboard and screen so without further ado let's dive into the computer over here and let's get to typing all right i've got my user's manual here but i've also collected some notes to guide the episode and these notes will be on the companion blog post that you'll find in the video description below so make sure and check that out and much of it is just a rehash or just a shorter version of what's in the guide to help me work through these tutorials so let's get started with some tutorials so here we have the Commodore plus four I do want to do just a little orientation around the keyboard because that's part of this chapter chapter two uh, you'll notice that we have our function keys up at the top here we've talked about those cursorily uh, pun intended by the way cursorily get it uh, a little bit before but we're going to spend more time with these today we're actually going to learn how to even program those today you'll find your escape key here control here but then you'll also notice that we have a control on the other other side so there's one on each side that is kind of different and unusual you'll also notice that some of these uh, special symbols are not where you are likely to find them on a modern keyboard we'll talk about those as we go we have our run stop key here which we'll use we have our shift lock here obviously we have our return key we have this key which is our Commodore key now in the notes I obviously don't have access to a Commodore key logo on a modern keyboard, which is a shame. I wish that were included in some way. But what I've done is a capital C with an equals because that's the closest thing we have. So you will see that in the notes. As a matter of fact, I can show you on my notes here that will represent the Commodore key. Shift key on either side, spacebar, and again, these, uh, these cursor controls over here, which I really like. So that is kind of our layout of the keys. Now let's go ahead and let's start to use some of the keys and find out how you use them to interact with the screen. Okay, the first thing that I want to uh, describe is, you'll remember before when we were typing print and retro, oops, there I go. Uh, you have to remember, and we'll get to that here in a minute, why I don't want to do that and here and then we'll do this so there's our line of code that we've been playing with uh, the first thing i want to do and i will go back to here is i'm going to hit this and this so that's the commodore and shift key now watch what happens when i go back to my monitor you'll notice that i go into lowercase and uppercase so i'm toggling lowercase and upper graphics mode by hitting commodore plus shift see that now that's interesting uh, first of all, because we have those modes, which you're not going to find anything like that on a modern computer, but we have those modes. And what I want to show you is that it really affects your code as well. Okay, so let me list my program. You'll see that everything is in lowercase mode. Uh, again, if I go ahead and Commodore Shift, that'll take it to uppercase. So there we go, lowercase. Now what I want to do is I want to run that code in both modes so that you see what happens. So let's go ahead and run and you'll notice that it prints all uppercase retro combs because we're in uppercase graphics mode. If I hit the Commodore Shift, now we're in lowercase mode and I run that program again, you'll see that we have it in lowercase. Now what happens if I list that program, I go back up here 
And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a shift C now that I'm in lowercase mode. You'll see that I have that. And I'm going to enter that and then I'm going to come back down and I'm going to run that code again. Watch what happens. So there now we have a combination of upper and lowercase. Now let's go ahead and change that back to uppercase mode. Watch what happens. You'll notice that my capital C changed to a graphic character. So let me list that again for you. So now the C is gone and we have that dash. If we were to look, and we will do that, if we look back on our keyboard at the C key, which is right here, you can't see it, but right there is a line, a horizontal line across. It is actually putting that character in that particular code. So in uppercase mode, we have access to the entire uppercase character set, as well as the characters on the right side of the keys. On these keys, and let me go up here where you can see it, you'll see a character on the left and a character on the right. In upper graphics, uppercase graphics mode, you have access to the E, capital E, the right graphic and the left graphic. So we know that shift will get you the right graphic. What gets you the left graphic? Well, let me go back and show you that. If I hit the shift C, I get the horizontal. Now, if I hit the Commodore and the C key, watch what I get. I get a little square in the upper right, and that coincides with the character that is displayed down here next to that character. And you can see that if you look closely right there. Now, interestingly, if I shift back to lowercase mode, you see that I get not, I can't get the right character anymore. I only get a lowercase c, an uppercase c, or with the Commodore key in the C, I get the left-hand corner. So those are the differences between modes for the Commodore. So um, you would have to be very careful if you're writing a program to know which mode you have access to. Now you can get to those other characters in another way. You just can't get to them from the keyboard. And when we talk about programming, we'll get to how we can get those characters back in say lowercase mode versus uppercase mode. And it's, it's simply a matter of knowing what the character code is for that character. Okay, the next key we wanna talk about is this run stop key. Now watch what happens. I'm gonna go back here and I'm gonna hit the run stop key and you'll notice nothing happens, right? Because there's nothing running right now to stop it. However, if I hit shift run, watch what happens. Okay, you'll notice that it is trying to load the first program on a disk drive. I do not have a disk drive connected. Now this is really interesting. This is, this is kind of weird. Check this out. I'm gonna hit it again and you'll see that it went through, it did it again and then nothing happened. If you remember, we do have a program in code. Now watch, I'm gonna hit it again, shift run stop, watch what happens. Now this is really weird, I don't understand this. If I run that command by itself twice, then it'll say there's nothing on the disk drive, nothing's present, but I do it one more time, nothing happens because there's no disk drive, but then I did it again, watch what happens. You'll notice that it actually printed out uh, the retro combs from my code. So it's very odd. You can use it to quickly run your program, your basic program. I'm gonna see if I can replicate this, hold on. We're gonna clear the screen. We're gonna shift run stop. Okay, there you go. So I cleared the screen. I shift run stopped. It doesn't run my code in program. I'm gonna do it one more time. You'll see that it didn't do it again. So that's two, let's try it one more time. You see that it did not do it again. Now watch, I'm gonna list the program. Shows it the program, now I'm gonna hit shift run stop, and then it runs the program. It's very odd. I don't know why it does that. If you can explain why it does that, let me know. But from here on out, as long as I don't clear the screen, it's gonna run that code. So a little tip for you. So there is the run stop. Of course, the other thing it would do is if there is a running program, you hit the run stop, it'll stop that program. So let's go ahead and add to our line so that you can see that operation. Let's list, we got that, we run, and we saw this in the last episode. Now I hit run stop, and that just stops the program. So there's run stop. Okay, the next thing I wanna cover are cursor keys. So we'll go back here, and remember those are right here. And what again, what's nice about the plus four as opposed to the VIC-20 or the Commodore 64, you only had one cursor key to represent up and down and one cursor key for left and right. You would have to use the shift and you have to go back and forth and do this. I'll tell you, there's, um, there's a YouTuber, 
His name is 8-Bit Show and Tell. I think his name is Robin. He's got this thing mastered, man. He, he shifts in the ups and downs like nobody's business. I've never seen anybody do it. I really prefer the cursor keys. I think they work really well. So if I go back here, you can see I can go up, down, I can go right, and I can go left. Now, the other thing that we have is we have a way that we can clear the screen and we can go home. Now, you've seen me clear the screen a few times. I'm doing it a little bit differently, but I do want to talk about it here. There is a clear home button right here. See that? That's our clear home button. Now, it will do several things. So let's go back and play with that and see what it will do. So the first thing I want to do is I want to hit it by itself. So just hitting the clear home all by itself. You'll notice what it does is it moves that cursor to the upper left corner. So what I'm going to move that down, do is move that cursor down. I'm going to hit clear home and you'll see that it just takes it and puts it back up to that corner, left hand corner. We'll call that our home position. All right. So if I run this program, for instance, and I hit my run stop, we've stopped it. I hit clear home. It takes us back up to the upper left hand position. Okay. Let's say I want to go ahead and move that up and clear the screen at the same time. What I can do is a shift clear home. And now that will clear the screen and move it to the home position, right? So again, the difference is here's run. Let's do this. If I hit home, it just takes it to that position. If I hit shift clear home, it clears it and takes it to that position. There's another way to clear. I'll show you in a little bit. that will do something similar to what we've just done, but also give you a ready prompt. So we'll, we'll cover that in just a minute. Now there is another feature of the clear home that we're not going to cover in this chapter. As a matter of fact, it's for a future chapter. I believe it's chapter four. Um, the plus four includes something called windows. We're not going to cover windows today because there's a whole chapter on it. So we'll be getting to it. But the clear home, if you were to hit it twice would clear all windows just to get us prepared for that. So we'll come back to windows a little bit later. All right, the next key that we have is the control key. And much like we're, what we're used to on modern computers, control keys work with other keys on the keyboard. Uh, we will spend more time with control as we go through successive chapters. For now, though, I do want to show you a few things that it can do. For instance, if I have a program that has a long list, I can pause that program. Now, I can't do it with just the code that I have. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some time and create a program that's a little bit longer for you. And what I'm going to do is, um, and so you may want to watch, follow along, see how I do this. I need to create a code with a lot of lines. So I'm simply going to do number one, and I'm going to do a rem statement or a remark statement, and I'm going to hit enter. Now, if I list that code, you'll see I have one REM 10 to, so it's adding to my code. Now, what I'm going to do though, is I'm going to, first of all, list one, and we'll be talking about these commands a little bit more. And then I'm going to go up here and I'm just going to hit Two. I'm going to replace the two or the one with a two and I'm just going to hit return. Now what that does is this. You'll see that it added. I didn't have to retype two space REM. I just go up and change the number at a new line number. So if I go here and hit three, what should I get? Uh, obviously you know what I'm going to get. I'm going to get that one in there. So it's really a neat way to add another or duplicate a line of code. This is a kind of a tip that most of us have known for years have used a Commodore. If you're brand new to Commodore, that might be kind of new for you. So uh, just watch and follow along. I'll speed this up as I edit and let's get some code in here. Got a lot of lines of code. Let's go ahead and list that. There you go. Now we've got a long list or line of code. That should be enough. I want to show you now what uh, you can do to pause your code as it's going along. So I'm going to list and then what I'm going to do is hit control S and that pauses your code. Hitting any other key will resume the code, okay? So again, list, we'll list your code, but if I hit list, hit control S, that will pause our code, okay? Now, interestingly, let's do list, and let's hit run stop. Run stop will also stop your code from listing. Now again, it's not pausing it, you can't resume it, but it does stop it immediately. So if you've got a long list of code, you can either, once again, control, oops, control S to pause it, any key to resume, or if you hit list and you want to stop it, hit run stop and that will stop your code, okay? So there, there's ways to control your long listing of code. We briefly talked about the Commodore key and how to use it to display these character sets on the left-hand side of the keyboard. The Commodore key also has some other functions. So as we know now, we can create graphic characters, we can switch between uppercase and lowercase, but if we go back to our example where we're listing a program, one of the things you'll notice is if I list a program, hold down the Commodore key, it does a slower line-by-line -line listing of that program. 
let up on it and it speeds up. So let's do that again. Hold the Commodore key, let up on it and it resumes. So that's another feature of the Commodore key. Let's go back to our keyboard and I wanna show you a couple of other unique keys that we have. We have this reverse on, reverse off, and then we also have uh, another area down here that's flash on and flash off. But the first thing I'm going to do is we are going to use reverse on. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to hit control nine, that will turn reverse on. Now watch what happens when I type. You'll notice I get reverse characters, okay? If I wanna turn that off, I hit control zero, and you'll see I have those, that same text, one reversed, one not reversed, okay? So how do you use that in a normal basis? Well, here's what's interesting. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna go back up to my code here. Now this code will still run. These are just all a bunch of rem statements. Let me just show you what will happen now if I run my code. Again, it's still gonna run the code, right? So let's go ahead and run stop that. Uh, let's go ahead and use our clear, shall we? Shift clear home, let's get that back up there. Let's list and you see our code. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back up here and this is really, again, where it gets kind of strange. I'm gonna do retro in um, the reverse case, okay? So I'm gonna hit control nine. So that turns it on, I'm gonna type R-E-T-R-O. Now right, uh, R-E-T-R-O, Stephen, there we go. Now right now, if I go here, it looks like what it would print is retro in reverse and combs and not reverse. Now let's go ahead and enter that code. Very interesting. Now I'm gonna run the program and I want you to watch what happens. So what you're seeing is nothing. It's really odd. Um, so you can't use it in a statement. Let me go ahead and run stop that. Uh, and, and then what happens is I've got a real issue here because I can't see anything anymore. I have, in effect, really just, uh, uh, so let me see if I can uh, clear home here. Let's try that. Uh, that doesn't fix it. Uh, if I hit run stop, nothing's happening there. Shift runs, nothing. If I hit my clear screen, nothing. I mean, that code, it may have stopped, but I have no cursor. Now, is there a way to get that back? I don't know. Let's try something. Uh, I just thought of something. I did not try this when I was demoing. I'm going to do control reverse off. Nothing there. Let's do control reverse on. Nothing there. So that's weird. And I know there are people out there in the Commodore world smarter than I am because, again, I'm kind of refamiliarizing myself. I'd love to know if somebody can tell me what's going on here. Uh, it does appear to be maybe a, a basic glitch or maybe it's a feature. Some people, some people's glitches are other people's features, right? Well, the good thing is I don't want to have to type all of that code in again. If you remember from the previous episode, there is a way to reset this device so that we maintain the contents of the memory. You remember how to do that? That's right, we hold the run stop key and then we're gonna hit the reset. So wish me luck here. Okay, so now we're back to our machine language monitor. If you remember from last time, we hit X, hit enter, and it should have reset the device with the code still in there. So let's list. Thankfully it is. So, and now look at the code. So this again is where it gets very strange with the Commodore 64. What happened to retro? It's now RRO combs. Very strange, very odd. Um, but now I see why they have that machine language monitor in there and that reset, because if this is the kind of stuff that was happening with to poor basic coders, there's an issue there. So um, I, just out of curiosity, what I kind of want to do is I want to run the code again. This is, I was demoing for this video when I was doing these things, it was very odd. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna run it again. I Actually, you know what, I'm not gonna run it again. Here's what I'm gonna do. Instead of putting the code at the front, I'm gonna do some code at the end that is in reverse. So I'm gonna do B and S. So I'm gonna hit Control-9 to reverse on, do B, S, and then Control-0 to reverse off, and Enter to enter that line of code. Uh, and I don't have to come all the way down here, but I'm going to just for grins, and then I'm gonna run it, let's see what happens. Okay, so now that's interesting because it ran the code, C-O-M, I'm assuming the whole code is still running, but what's happening, because remember it should loop, but what's happening is it's not displaying anything else, so that reverse on code is causing that hiccup in the code. Let's see if we can run stop. Okay, it did run stop this time, and I've got my ready back. So if it's at the end, 
it blanks everything at the end. If it's at the beginning, it blanks everything at the beginning and you're not gonna see anything. Now I'm really curious to see, let me go ahead and clear home here. I'm really curious to see what it did to my code. Remember how it got rid of retro before? We should have COM uh, with BS in reverse. Let's see what we have. Okay, so it saved at that time. So if you put it at the beginning, you get some weirdness. If you put it at the end, it won't display anything after. Now I have to run one more test. I'm sorry, I just have to. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go back in here. I'm going to add a retro space and we're gonna hit enter. So now what we've done is we've got that code in the middle, that reverse code in the middle. <laughs> Let's see what happens here. So what's going on there then? So now we've got retro, I mean, what, what, isn't that just weird? What are we seeing there? If I hit run stop, I did at least get that back. I hit list and there you go. So there's the weirdness with reverse characters. If somebody can explain this to me and maybe we'll learn more about it as we go on through the manual, but I'd be really curious uh, if anybody can tell me what's going on here. If you can leave a comment below, if you're uh, watching from the blog post, uh, make sure you leave a comment below in the blog post. Okay, so that is the reverse. There's also another version of uh, kind of character uh, emphasis and it's called flashing. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go back up here to the same bit of code and we're gonna do flashing. Instead of being reverse BS, we're gonna do flashing BS. Boy, that didn't sound good, did it? Uh, not intended, but kind of funny. So let's do some, uh, let's do some flashing BS, shall we? Uh, so what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna hit control and then it's going to be the comma key to flash. So control flash is now on. So now I do B and S and now I'm going to do control uh, period to turn flash off. So now I have a flashing BS. This just gets funnier and funnier all the time. So I've got flashing BS. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to clear my screen um, here and let's list that program again. So you see that it's okay. Do you see what happened? So the, the <laughs> it's really bizarre but you see I printed my code, now the flashing BS is gone and it just put screen clear in there. Where did that even come from? So it's, it's very odd and if I run my code, you'll see that it just runs it like it should. And there we go. So again, let's, let's try this again. Let's do something different this time. Let's put our flashing code at the front and see what happens. And so what we're gonna do is hit flash on and uh, we're gonna do CO, there we go. We'll turn flash off. And we'll go ahead and backspace. We'll hit, um, oh, let's add a couple of characters. S, uh, Steven, uh, shift, and there. Let's do that, that'll be interesting. Now we'll hit enter, come down here. We'll hit run, and you'll see that it does everything. Comb Steven. Uh, nothing is flashing, so everything seemed to be okay there as long as it was at the beginning this time. We hit run stop. Now let's list our program and you'll see that everything seems to be normal and flashes off. So again, it, really weird. It's un unexpected what you're going to get with the flash and the reverse. There's some examples of some uh, Commodore basic weirdness, at least is what I think it is. Again, if it's a feature, let me know. If it's a quirk, also let me know. Okay, the next thing we wanna do is talk about the escape key. That's right here, as you can see. And what you're gonna find is we use this in conjunction with other keys. It's a little different than what you use on modern computers, although if we've got some old terminal folks out there, it's gonna be very similar to what you're used to with an old terminal. So let's go back to here. And uh, what I have is a list of all of the escape codes that we will look at here uh, on the companion to blog post. Make sure you see that link in the description below. Uh, but what I wanna do is kind of work through some of these because this the escape key is really used to help you work through programming. So it'll do things that we're used to on maybe like a Mac or a Windows machine where we move to points in a line, delete sections of a line, those types of things. Well, on the Commodore, you use the escape key to do those things. So I'm gonna demonstrate those. The escape key works a little bit differently than what you're gonna find on most modern computers, although some folks who have been around since the early days of terminals will find this pretty familiar. However, the escape key is not like the shift key when it comes to 
the Commodore 64. What you're going to do is you're going to hit the escape key followed by another key, not shift in a key, but the escape key followed by another key. And I've got a list of those that I'm going to cover here today with me. I'm not going to cover every one of them, but I do want to talk about the ones that let you uh, kind of work around the screen, move around the screen, delete things, move to end the lines, beginning of lines, inserts, all those types of things. So let's go ahead and look at the example I have. So here's our code. Now, you'll notice up here, uh, I've been playing around and I've got some weirdness in my code right here. And I just want to change all of that to be retro combs again. So what I'm going to do is come over here and I'm going to backspace all of this. I'm going to add my uh, shift and my thing there and then I'm going to add my semicolon. Now I want retro chromes at the beginning. Now if I go back here, oh there we go, you see you got some weirdness going on there with my cursor key. See if I can clear that out. This is some of the weirdness of um, if I hit when I'm programming on a line, if I hit my cursor key I start to get some really strange things. I'm not sure what is happening there. Uh, but you'll see right now that takes care of it. So again, we'll figure that out as we go along, hopefully. But now let's go back and I want to put retro before this. Now if I start typing right now, it's going to overwrite. There is a way that you can insert characters and you can actually do that with your shift and insert button. We'll move everything to the right. Now I can keep doing that five more times to get retro in there. Um, so again, shift and insert, which is that upper right hand key, will move it over one character. Or I can use insert mode, auto insert mode, which is escape. And I'm going to show you how I'm doing this. Let me go back to my keyboard. I'm going to hit escape and A. Okay, did you see that? So I just tapped it and tapped it. When I go back to here, watch what happens when I type. You'll see it's in auto insert mode, so everything's just moving over to the right. Got it? Now if I want to cancel that, then what I do is I hit escape and C, and that will cancel that code. And you see it's just moving over uh, regularly now, okay? So that's auto insert. Uh, again, all of these codes will be listed in the companion blog post, so make sure you check that out. I've done, a, I think, a really great job of, of, of trying to highlight what I'm copying here, or what I'm sharing with you, uh, so that you have quick access to it. Now let's say we want to delete a line. So I'm going to go up here and uh, I'm going to go one of my rem statements. Let's go to number eight right there. And I want to delete that entire line. If I hit escape D, watch what happens. That line is gone. Now, is it really gone? Let's check it out. Let's list. And you'll see when I do, it comes back, it's number eight. So it's just deleting what's in the display. It's not deleting what's in memory. It's just deleting what's in the display. So I can feel comfortable. <laughs> I think I'm comfortable. If I hit escape here and D, that line is gone, moved everything up. Let's see, hopefully it's there, right? Uh, and hit list, okay? And it's back, right? Well, what if I do this? Let's see, let's try something else. If I hit zip and then delete that line, it's gone. There's no way to hit enter, to, to delete. I mean, all it again, all it does is the screen, it clears a line on the screen. Everybody got that? All right, so that's one. Now, what if I want to insert a line? Okay, well, escape D deletes it. What do you think inserts it? Yeah, pretty obvious. Escape I, watch what happens. So now I've got that line above. Now if I wanted to go back in here and type in 28, uh, I could go ahead and do that, although we do know that that line's already in memory. So I just hit enter. and do it. So there, there's a way that you can delete and insert lines. That's pretty cool. I really like that, that's, that's handy. Now what if you wanna move, for instance, to the end of a line? Uh, so what I'm going to do now is that is a J and a K, uh, and that'll be familiar with some folks out there, especially our gamers. Some of our gamers will know J and K. Okay, there's also another escape code for screen scrolling, and this is uh, escape L and escape M. Escape L will stop scrolling, and then escape M will turn scrolling on. So let me share what I mean by that. Before I do that though, what I want to do is I want to create a few more lines of code here. So I'm going to do a 30, 31, bear with me a minute. Okay, so I've got some lines of code. Let's list. There we go. So now it's multiple lines of code. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop screen scrolling. Um, so right now as I scroll, the screen just scroll smoothly, right? It goes to the next line. If I turn that off with a escape M, I want you to watch what happens. 
You'll notice the screen doesn't scroll, it overwrites itself. All right, so let's do a list again. Watch what happens. Notice that it overwrites each other. Now I'm going to escape and L to turn on screen scrolling again. And then I've got to, I have to uh, get a little space here. So let me go ahead and do this right here. And then I'm gonna type list and then you'll see it scrolls again. So see how that works? So scrolling on, escape M, list, scrolling off, list, and there we go, scrolling's back on, okay? Uh, interesting, we've got something weird over there. Let's, let me list that again. What is going on here? Look at this, isn't this odd? So here, here's some more of that really weird stuff that's happening. Oh, it's because it's, there's an S in my rim statement. I get it. So let's go ahead and delete that. And 21 REM. There we go. There we go. That fixes it. All right. There's another escape code, which is handy when dealing with some of these special characters. So this is the escape and O. So let me show you how this works. So I'm going to turn on flashing again. All right. Here's flashing. So I'll do a couple of characters. Now, if I do escape and O, watch what happens. That will turn flashing off. So it's just another way of not using the reverse off or the flash off. It will turn that off. So this will cancel the insert, the quote, which we'll learn in chapter four. There's a quote feature, uh, reverse and flash. Okay, let's go ahead and look at our code. Now what we're gonna do is look at some escape functions which will delete parts of a line. So we've already talked about how to delete a line, an entire line. If you remember, that was escape and D. That deletes an entire line. Uh, remember that line's still there, but let's go to 39 now and let's go and put the cursor on the R. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit um, escape and P. So watch what happens when I hit escape and then P. You'll notice that from that position to the left, it deleted everything, right? Now that again, that line's still there. If I go ahead and list, you'll see that line is still there, 39. Let's do the same thing, but not with a P this time. What we're going to do now is we're going to use the Q. So what do you think is gonna happen if I hit escape Q, knowing that escape P did everything from that cursor to the left, escape Q does everything from that cursor to the right. So again, it's a way to clear out. So this would be really handy, for instance, up here, if I wanted to retype this completely, I could hit escape Q and I could type retro combs and space and shift and then do our semicolon hit enter and now that's back there and so there's a there's a, a handy way to use that so now if we run our code there you hit run stop and there you go so those are our escape codes again all of those are listed in the companion blog post they're obviously found in the user's manual as well. Now, I thought this next part was kind of fun. In the user's manual, it talks about the Commodore keyboard having special characters that you don't find on things like a typewriter. Anybody remember a typewriter? And those keys, I have those listed here because I had to remember what they think are special keys that you're not gonna find. So for instance, there is this pound code here. We're not gonna find a pound key on an American keyboard. Uh, but that's pounds uh, for British currency. There's also a, a way to get the pi symbol, which is right here. You can see that if we hit our Commodore key and the equal key, we'll get the um, pi symbol. There's also a left arrow key. You can see that here. And there is an up arrow key if we hit here. Now, what's interesting is there's no left or, or I mean, there's no right arrow or or down arrow. So for some reason, those two keys were special. I'm not sure why. Uh, and then also some of the other fun ones that they said that aren't normally found on a regular keyboard is we have our less than and greater than symbol and our brackets. But uh, according to the user's manual, those were unique in the 80s on a keyboard. Okay, now we get to finish up this episode with a discussion of the function keys. And uh, so what I will do is go back here to the monitor. Uh, in the function keys, you can see what those do either by looking in the manual, looking in my show notes uh, at the companion website, or we can just type key. If I type key, it tells you what those keys are, what commands are assigned to those keys right now. And what you'll notice is there's a specific syntax there. So let's talk about each of these. Key one will, if I type it, hit sys1525. And basically what that does is it will load the um, Commodore Plus 4 integrated software. So if I hit F1, it lists that. Now I would need to hit enter 
to go ahead and load that software. I'm not going to do that. That's for future episodes. We'll come back to the software later, but that will put in the three plus one software. Okay, the next one is key two. Key two types the deload command followed by this character string. This is chr dollar symbol uh, dollar sign and then there's a 34. This character string is a quotation mark. So what it does is types deload a quotation mark. You could type the name of a program that you wanted to load from your disk, close it with another quotation and it would load that command or it would load that program from the disk drive. The other one, if you hit key three, is a directory and the directory is followed by a character string 13. A character string 13 is the return key. So it's going to enter this command and hit, or hit enter for you automatically. You also have screen clear, S-C-N-C-L-R for key four, followed by now that we know is the return key. We have dsave followed by, again, the quotation. Enter the name that you want, close the quotation. It would load, or I'm sorry, it would save that program. You also have run followed by enter. You have list followed by enter, and you have help followed by enter. So let's talk about uh, each of these briefly. We've hit key one, and you see we have that. Now we are not going to do that, so that is not good. So I'm gonna hit escape and D, and that's gonna clear that line out for me. Remember that I don't have to go all the way to the end and delete anymore. Now we have escape and D, now we know how to get rid of a line. If I hit key two, right across the top, that's D load, and I would tape a uh, program here. I would hit the close quotations, I would hit enter, and I'm gonna get an error, but you'll see that there's it's searching, but there's nothing there. Now, there will be something there, just a little hint. I mentioned this before, we're gonna be using a Raspi 1541, which is a Raspberry Pi Zero connected to a hat that'll emulate a res, or that will emulate a 1541 drive, so that's on its way. So we'll get to play with that when we start talking about files and loading, which is coming up in a future chapter. Okay, the next one we have is the screen clear. That's key four. Key four requires a shift. So let me go back here and show you this. So that is a shift and F4. So you use the shift to get F4, F5, F6, and F7. It's not control, it's not Apple, or Apple. Yeah, it tells you where I am. It's not Commodore, it is the shift. So shift, this one will give you that command. So go back, do shift F4, and that gets us a screen clear. Now you may see me uh, clearing the screen quite a bit. I've been doing that, shift F4, I've started to remember from muscle memory now. Uh, now it's different. If you remember there was a shift clear home, shift clear home takes you to the upper left corner, clears the screen, Shift F4 clears the screen and then gives you a ready prompt. So those are the differences between the two. I prefer the F4 because it gives me the ready prompt, kind of sets it down there a little bit. But again, you could just clear home, do a list, and you can do that as well, okay? So let me go ahead and shift F4. So there's that one. Let's go back to key. Uh, key five is the D save. So key five is another shift and hit. And you can see we could enter the name of the program close the quotation and get an error. Perfect, device not present. The next one is run, and that is function key six. So function key six is a shift, hit that, and you'll see that'll run my code. So if it's too much for you to type, are you in enter, you can always hit shift F6. Now we'll exit this by hitting run stop. Let's do it again. Shift F6, it runs and stop or again it's the same thing as run why is it the same thing as run it's the same thing as run because what it's doing is typing run followed by the return key got it that's how that works let's go ahead and do a list that's f7 so that's a shift and that's going to list my code again if it's too much to type list and enter you can do that shift f7 is the same as list and again uh, all it is doing is typing that command followed by enter. Now there's also help. Now this is interesting. I'm gonna do help by itself so you can see what happens. If I hit help or I hit F, it's actually, it's really weird because it's really an F8 key, but it's not because it's on the left and it's just a very bizarre arrangement. But I'm gonna hit a help and you'll see there is no help. There's nothing. Now, I would assume if you're like in an integrated software package or some other software, you hit help, that's programmable, it would bring up some help. However, there is a feature built in for basic programming and the help key. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to list 20 and I'm going to go up here and I'm going to uh, butcher this. I'm going to put go, go to 10, go, go 10. All right. That is not a command. And then I'm going to run the program. Hey, let's, let's use uh, F6 to run the program since we're using function keys. Now, what you'll notice is 
I get an error in line 20. It's obviously not go, go. Check this out. If I hit help right now on my keyboard, it's going to go to the line where there's an error and highlight or flash what the error is. So if I go back in here now and I fix that to a T, hit enter and run, everything should be good to go and everything's working. So I hit hit and if I help, again, there's nothing error. So if you've got errors in code, it will help you identify those. Now let's try something else here. Let me go ahead and list 10 to 20. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a couple of errors. I'm going to do printy. Let's do print here and let's do go go here. So now uh, let me get this one and this one. Now we've got two errors in our code. If we run it, you can see we have error in line 10. What happens if I hit help? So what it's going to do is it's going to give you each line in order as you, it's not going to list them all at the same time. It's going to work you through each line that has an error. So let's go ahead and fix primp back to print. We know that's right. Let's run. Again, we get an error. We hit help. There's our other one. We hit go to. We do that. We run. Or again, we can hit uh, shift F6 and everything's working. So there's how the help can help you as you're working through a basic program. We'll stop that right there. Let's go ahead and clear our screen right here. I want to type in key and I want to show you one last thing that you can do. These function keys are all programmable. Okay, this is this is really kind of cool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reprogram uh, key one. I don't want it to pull up the software. I'm going to type in key one. If you follow the syntax that it has up there, now I can put whatever command in there I want. So uh, let's use, uh, let's just make it type a word. Let's, let's just make it type retro comb, shall we? And then I'm going to hit shift and quotation. And uh, that's it for the syntax. So if I hit enter, now you'll see that nothing happens. But if I type key, you'll see that that has been reprogrammed as retro comb. So if I hit F1, watch what happens. It types in retro combs for me. So it's like a little short macro. So if I knew I was going to use that on a regular basis, I could, sh and I'm not going to use the other command that was mapped there, then I can use that uh, feature to remap that function key to type that. Now, obviously that's not a command. I'm going to get an error if I hit that. Uh, but it could be handy if you do um, have like maybe a, a, a session of programming where you're going to type the same thing in over and over. Uh, it would be a good, good quick way to do that. So you could use the function keys as macros too. Now here's the problem. When you reset the computer, that's gone, right? So let's go ahead and reset so I can show you what that looks like. So I reset the computer, I type key, and you can see that that's gone. Now, if I type key uh, one comma, and I type retro combs, and uh, there, and hit enter, uh, let's do key again. Let's hit key one, there it is. Now, remember, if I reset the computer, it's gone. However, if we do our run, stop, and reset, we exit out of the machine language monitor, we type key, it's still there. So in case you were curious about whether that code would still be there. And that is it for chapter two, entitled The Keyboard and the Screen. And that concludes this episode of chapter two, using the keyboard and the screen. Now you're gonna to wanna to make sure you hit subscribe below because you're gonna to wanna to receive notifications when the chapter three episode is released. Oh, and while you're at it, hit that little bell down there so you get an alert whenever that new episode is released. I would also encourage you to look down in the show description for the link to the companion website. I mentioned it throughout the episode. A lot of great resources, additional things you're not gonna find in the video, all the links that you need. And then also, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm also scanning every chapter of the book here so that you can follow along. And even if you don't have a plus four, remember you can use the Vice emulator, which I'll probably talk about later, to install on your computer and you can follow along that way. For now, I'd love to hear your feedback. Send me comments below the uh, description in the YouTube video, but also you can send comments on the companion blog post. And I would love to read those. And again, 
help answer some of those questions. Let's make this a community event. I ha obviously have some confusion in this video. I want to know why things are the way things are. And I know there are people out there in the Commodore community who are smarter than I am on these things. And let's build to that community. Let's build to those notes. I'll add those comments into our blog post, our companion blog post, and let's keep learning about the Commodore Plus 4. So thanks again for watching and Retro Combs out.